Welcome to Drive and Worship at First Baptist Church of Elkin. We are so glad that you're here, and it's great to be worshiping with you this morning. To access the bulletin for today, you can go to elkinfbc.com forward slash bulletin. That's elkinfbc.com forward slash bulletin. And if you would like to hear us better through the radio, you can tune into 87.9. That's 87.9. Also, if you brought offering today, you can drop it off in the plate as you exit. Peggy will be under the breezeway with Lance and I, and you can um, drop your offering there. And Lance and I will be there to greet you if you would like to stop by and say hey on your way out. We would love to greet you. I do have a few announcements for us this morning. Uh, first, CBF of North Carolina is starting a new missions network called the Welcome House Community Network. And the goal is to establish welcome houses all over the state, like the one in Raleigh that's led by Mark and Kim Wyatt. This ministry welcomes refugees and immigrants into the welcome house and helps them assimilate into their community. CBF is trying to raise $10,000 to help kick off this effort, and our missions committee is donating $500 towards that effort. And we would like for the congregation to match that gift so that we can contribute $1,000 to the overall goal. So if you would like to give towards the Welcome House, please mark your check or the envelope that you put your money in as a Welcome House, and we really appreciate your contributions towards that effort. Also, our annual Trunk or Treat is coming up on October the 31st from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. We need 20 trunks um, in order to make this a successful trunk or treat. We've never done it quite like we're doing it this year. We say that a lot in 2020. But if you are interested in coming out and decorating your trunk to hand out candy, please see me. We also need an abundance of candy donations, maybe more candy than we've needed in the past so that we can fix up treat bags. So there is a bin in the uh, glass foyer. If you would like to donate candy, you can drop it off in the glass foyer anytime this month and we would appreciate that and thank you so much for helping out and making this event successful today we extend the love and the peace of christ to each of you and we welcome you to worship at this time please join us if you if you are able in singing this morning's call to worship hymn 467 there shall be showers of blessings
Good morning, friends and family here at our drive-in worship and those at home listening or watching online. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you so much for all of the blessings you have bestowed upon us this week. Forgive us our missteps and allow us to learn from all of those these things going forward. Please fill our service today with your word and your love. May we put aside our fears and doubts and remember that you will provide whatever we need to live, love, grow, and go. It is a very scary time with all that our nation, state, and community are facing. It is easy to give in to that fear which allows us a plethora of other feelings like hate, anxiety, depression, to name a few, to overtake us. We need you, God, to replace these feelings with love peace and happiness, or the world will not be able to change. I ask that you open your hearts today so that he can work through us to be better in the weeks to come. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me now in our hymn of praise, hymn 62, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. When my spirit 
Corinthians 10, <clears throat> warning against idolatry. I do not want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. God guided all of them by sending a cloud that moved along ahead of them, and he brought them all safely through the waters of the sea on dry ground. As followers of Moses, they were all baptized in the cloud and the sea, and all of them ate the same miraculous food, and all of them drank the same miraculous water, for they all drank from the miraculous rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet after this, God was not pleased with most of them, and he destroys them in the wilderness. <clears throat> these are the these words are the gift of God. Thank you. Thank you. The Israelites are at it again this week, participating in their favorite pastime, complaining. They've been freed from Egyptian captivity under Pharaoh. The Red Sea has split wide open for them to escape from Pharaoh. God has provided sweet water and bread from heaven 
for the Israelites. At this point, after God had been so faithful, you would think that Israel would have learned to have a little faith. But as we're going to see today in these first few verses of Exodus 17, trusting God is not the Israelites' best quality. They really struggle in this area, and if you are here this morning and you are struggling with trusting God, I hope that this message will encourage you and challenge you in your walk with Christ. If you brought your Bible with you today, we are going to be in Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. And I want to preface this by saying that um, I am from South Carolina, and there is a word that I have to say a lot today, and it is water. And everybody makes fun of me because they say that I say water. So please, if you hear me say the word water today, please know that I'm talking about water. Okay, with that being said, Exodus 17, we're going to start in verses 1 through 3. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So on the way to the promised land, the Israelites have found themselves to be in a place where there is no water. They are thirsty. I'm sure that many of them are getting dehydrated. They've traveled from the desert to a place called Rephidim. And Rephidim in Hebrew means like a place of refreshment. So their assumption is that when they get to this place called Rephidim, that they are going to be able to get refreshed, they're going to be able to relax, you know, cucumber pills over the eyes, bottomless mimosas, but no, they get there and there is none of that. There is not even a drop of water and they want to know where the water is at and they aren't asking politely either. They are quarreling with Moses. It's like they're going into panic mode and they're starting to get angry and before we judge the Israelites too harshly, I want us to think about their perspective for just a moment. These people had been held captive by Pharaoh, who was viewed as a sort of god, and they were abused and used for labor to elevate the power and the ego of the Pharaoh. You don't just walk away from an environment like that unscathed. They had some major PTSD, if you will, when it comes to God and authority. So here they all are running around in the desert with Moses and they have to wonder, okay, what is really going on here? Is Moses just going to use us like Pharaoh used us? Is this where we've come to die? Even with Pharaoh out of the picture, the memory of captivity remains for Israel. And that is true for all of us as well. We always bring parts of our past into our present. We have to acknowledge that the way we see and experience the world is not created in a vacuum. Our pasts, no matter how good or how bad they may be, they inform our present realities. Israel is allowing their lack of trust from the past to plague their present situation as well, even though God has proven to be faithful to them. They've just been hurt, and it's hard to see. It's hard for us to see when we've been hurt or we're going through something difficult. It's hard to recognize God's faithfulness. I've shared this with the youth group. Uh, I'm not sure if I've shared this from the pulpit before. I'm sorry if I have. But um, I like to keep a prayer journal. I, I write out my prayers a lot. And I was going through a, a dry spell, if you will, where I just felt like God wasn't close to me. 
and I had stopped writing in my prayer journal, and I just, I picked it up one day, and I started reading through it, and I realized that every single thing I had prayed about, every single page, I had an answer to. God had been faithful to me. I had answers and solutions to all of it. And I thought, wow, how foolish of me to entertain the notion that God wasn't close to me or that God wasn't moving in my life. Even when it's hard to recognize and difficult to trust, God is always working. And I don't know why this is true. I have some opinions that I'll say for another sermon at another time. But I've learned in my life that the hardest places in life are also the holiest places. Some of the most difficult things that I've been through in my life have been the times when I have felt God the closest to me and when I've grown the most as a person. So I encourage you to seek out Jesus in the difficult spaces and allow that to become holy space because I promise you that Jesus is there with you in it. But in our story today, the Israelites are struggling to trust God. The text says that they're quarreling with Moses. And Moses asks, why are you testing the Lord? The word test there is actually legal language. They are not just fussing. They are putting Moses, and by default, God, on trial. It's like they're going to court out here in the wilderness of the desert, and they feel that God has some explaining to do. Have you all ever felt like God has some explaining to do? I know that God has a plan, but a lot of times it feels more like an experiment. And the Israelites are not interested in participating. They're dehydrated. They're thirsty. And this legal language helps us understand verse 4. Verse 4 says, So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. So Moses isn't being dramatic here. He is serious. They're getting ready to kill him. The Israelites have rendered a verdict of guilty, and the punishment is death by stoning. They're out collecting rocks, looking for just the right stone for a perfect execution. And Moses is like, what am I going to do now, God? I have followed you out into this desert. I've brought all these people with me. You have to do something. And I love God's response. It is quite beautiful. The Israelites have not trusted God like they should have. They've accused Moses and God of bringing them out into the desert to die. I think it would be totally reasonable for God to be upset with them. But that is not what happens. Look at verses 6, excuse me, 5 and 6. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God provided for their need. God could have easily said, are you kidding me? They're hurling accusations at me. They're getting ready to kill the leader that I've raised up for them. I'm not going to help them. But instead, God provided. We're often thirsty too, physically and spiritually. Maybe there's a physical need that you have. Food, water, shelter, a place to sleep. Or maybe there is a spiritual need that you have. Community, hope, faith, 
forgiveness. And I have to believe, based on God's character in this story and throughout the rest of Scripture, that God is ready to provide for your need. But then I look at the world and I see how many needs aren't met. I see how many people are thirsty and they're praying for a miracle and then nothing happens. And the only conclusion that I can come to is that the problem is not with God. The problem so often lies with us. God could have just given the Israelites water, but God used Moses to crack open a rock with a stick. And just like that miracle happened by God through a human vessel, God is also ready to use us to be someone's miracle. You can provide the food and the shelter. You can provide the community and the hope. God is ready to use us to crack open some rocks and satisfy thirst in this world. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, if you don't do it, then God will just move on. You'll miss your opportunity to bless someone and God will just use somebody else to do it. And I just don't believe that's true. I think that is bad theology. I believe that every single one of us is on this earth with meaning and purpose. There are only things that you can do, and that is why you are you. I sound like Dr. Seuss. (laughs) But remain open to the idea that there are people all around you who are physically and spiritually thirsty, and God is ready to use you to be someone's miracle. So Moses does what God tells him to do, but I think it's interesting that the text tells us that God will stand there at the rock in front of Moses. The text doesn't tell us that the Israelites acknowledged or thanked God for providing the water. And I think we can totally envision this scene. The Israelites are angry at God. They're angry at Moses. And so Moses goes on ahead of them and he cracks open this rock in the middle of the desert and water bursts forth from it. The Israelites who are standing back, they see the water. They're so thirsty and they just run towards it and they start lapping it up. Not once recognizing the miracle that this water is coming from a dry rock in the middle of the desert or the fact that God is standing right there at the rock providing for their need. Maybe what the Israelites needed wasn't water. Maybe they needed to trust God. Don't forget to acknowledge God's provision. It is so easy for us to take the blessing and love the blessing without thanking the one who does the blessing. It reminds me of that story in the book of Luke where Jesus heals the ten lepers. And out of the ten who are healed, only one returns to praise God and thank Jesus. And Jesus says, where, where are the other nine? I thought I healed ten of you. And to the one who came back, he said, your faith has made you well. Perhaps a true measure of how blessed we are isn't all tied up in how often God gives us what we think we need. But recognizing that God is actually with us in our need. Which is a great transition into the final verse for this morning, verse 7. He called the place Massah and Meribah. Because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Inquiring minds want to know, Is the Lord among us or not? That, that question is wrestled with throughout Scripture, and it's one that we often have today, especially in the midst of chaos. And I think it's perfectly reasonable question to ask. When there's a global pandemic causing over 200,000 U.S. deaths and making us retreat into our homes, is the Lord with us 
or not. When our black brothers and sisters suffer racial injustice and are profiled at a higher, at a disproportionately higher rate than others, is the Lord among us or not? When our streets erupt in violence, looting and fires, is the Lord among us or not? When our Democrat and Republican leaders spend more time attacking one another than coming together to create any type of solutions, is the Lord among us or not? The answer that the scriptures give us is a resounding yes. God is with us. And not only are we given that promise in Scripture that God is with us, but we see it on full display in the person of Jesus. I love what Paul does in our Scripture reading this morning from 1 Corinthians 10. He interprets the rock that the Israelites drank from as Jesus. He says they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. And I want us to unpack that just a little bit because there's more than meets the eye that's happening here. Paul reads Jesus back into the Old Testament all the time, which is great because we can see through his interpretation how Jesus is present with us throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. But he says that Jesus the rock followed them. Well, when we read the story, we don't really see anything in the text about them taking the rock with them or the rock traveling with them as they went through the desert. But when we get to the book of Numbers, there's an almost identical rock story where Moses has a stick, he cracks open a rock, water comes out, and everybody drinks. Well, most scholars think that this is probably one and the same story, and it's just told in two different places. But ancient Jewish Second Temple interpreters they got pretty creative with how they would read the scriptures. And so when they read these two similar stories, their conclusion was that that rock must have traveled with the Israelites, uh, with them all throughout the desert, satisfying their thirst. Kind of like the Israelites would have had a portable drinking fountain out in the desert. That's how Paul would have understood this story. And it's why he says, The rock followed them. And that matters because Paul can say that the Savior, Jesus, was always with the Israelites, satisfying their thirst. Just like the Savior is always with us, satisfying our thirst. And Paul knows that to be true because of what Jesus teaches us about himself. Whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 4. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. John 6. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John 7. I don't know about you, but I have plenty of days when I'm thirsty for the things in life that might quench my thirst, but they won't necessarily satisfy it. I can easily lose sight of the living water, and I can settle for a nice bottle of Dasani. And I truly believe that God wants so much more for us than what we want for ourselves like the Israelites who several times are ready to rush back to captivity under Pharaoh because they don't want to spend one more day out in the desert when they are on their way to a land of freedom that is flowing with milk and honey. Jesus is our milk and honey. Jesus is our safe place of refuge. Jesus is our abundant joy and hope if we would only come and drink from the rock and be satisfied. And we have the opportunity to do that very thing today by participating 
in the Lord's Supper on this World Communion Sunday when Christians all over the world unite in this symbolic act of grace as we remember Jesus' sacrificial death for the forgiveness of sins. But before we move into the Supper Liturgy together, I want to say this to you. Today's text poses a fundamental question to how we live our lives on a daily basis. Is the Lord among us or not? If our answer is no, then we live a very different sort of life than we would if our answer is yes. When our answer is yes, and we know that Jesus goes before us, walks beside us, and pushes us forward, then we can walk in a freedom that is marked by trust and risk, peace and discomfort, humility and confidence. But when our answer is no, the path we walk is one of bondage, marked by fear and doubt, boasting and insecurity. When you feel trapped in the desert, unsure of how to satisfy your thirst, I hope that you'll ask, the very question that the Israelites ask, is the Lord with me? And may you live in the freedom of knowing that the answer is yes. Yes, because the rock that is Jesus Christ has been broken so that streams of living water may flow to restore your soul and mine. As we prepare our hearts to eat and drink in remembrance of this broken Christ, I ask that you join me in the reaffirmation of the covenant that you can find in your bulletin. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, we clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. We bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, we forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven us, we also must forgive. Above all, we clothe ourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. We let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, to which indeed we were called as one body, and we are thankful. We let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. We teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in our hearts, we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever we do in word or deed, we do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. At this time, let's take a moment to pray silently, and then if you would, join me in the prayer of confession that's in your bulletin. Let's pray. Forgive us, O God, when we linger too long by the waters and on the mountaintops, enthralled with the glory that flows from you. When we fail to listen to your voice, shake us from our contentment. And forgive us of our many sins. Help us to move forward filled with your power so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways through Christ our Lord. Amen. God's light has come into the world and has scattered the darkness. The morning star rises in our hearts. Rejoice, for God does not hold our sins against us but embraces us as God's own beloved. To all who confess their sins, Christ says, your sins are forgiven. Amen. The Lord's Supper today as safely as possible with the wafer and the juice cup that you were given as you arrived this morning. If you have a child in the car with you and you do not feel that they are quite ready to partake of the elements, we also have uh, individually wrapped seedless grapes for them. 
does everyone who chooses to participate in communion this morning have their wafer cup or grape? If you do not, please stick your hand out of the window, raise your hand, and we will have an usher come by and make sure that you have a cup. Great. When Jesus poured the wine and the bread was broken, all were welcome to eat. The outcast and the beloved, the arrogant and the gracious, the wrongdoer and the wrongly done by. The table became a foretaste of love made real and of a world made whole. So partake all who are fearful to be made new in love. All who are doubtful to be made strong in faith. And all who are regretful to be made whole. Partake each of you to feast together as the family of God. Please receive these words from 1 Corinthians 11 as we partake of the supper together. And on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Eternal God, Pour out your Holy Spirit on all those who are gathered here so that we might be your light in the world. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. May they be infused with the gift of your nourishing guidance. Transform us with your nurturing grace. Transfigure us to be your presence in the world and reclaim each of us by your great love and spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we sing our closing song today, I just want to remind you that this grassy altar is open for you. If you feel the need to come forward and pray, please do so. I would be honored to pray with you if you would like me to. Also, please know that if you drank from the rock this morning and you would love to join us here at First Baptist, if you've realized today that you need a family to love and support you, we would be honored to welcome you into our family because we welcome all who claim Christ as Lord. Let's sing together. struggles keep you near the cross and may your troubles show that you need God and may your battles end the way they should and may your bad days prove that God is good, and may your whole life prove that God is good. See, may your struggles keep you near the cross, and may your battles end the way they should, and may your troubles show 
And may your bad days prove that God is good. And may your whole life prove that God is good. And may your struggles keep you near the cross. And may your troubles show that you need God. And may your battles end. And may your bad days prove that God is good. And may your whole life prove that God is good. May your struggles keep you near the cross. May your thirst in the wilderness be satisfied by Christ the rock. May your answer to whether God is among us or not always be yes. And may your whole life prove that God is good. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.